Hi, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our topic for today is ethics and law. Now, ethics tells us what's good and what we morally ought to do. On the other hand, law tells us what's legal and what we legally ought to do. But what's the relationship between the two? Now, here is to discuss uh, this question is Professor Garrett Cullity, Professor of Philosophy at the Australian National University. So welcome, Professor Garrett. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be on your show. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so before we get into answering the question, uh, let's get into your philosophical background first. So how did you get into philosophy? How did you get started in philosophy? Yeah, so I was an undergraduate um, at the University of Western Australia. Um, and I was one of these people who couldn't really make up his mind um, what I wanted to specialize in. So in my first year of university, I did philosophy, French, English, and maths. Um, and then as I went through, I, I narrowed things down, and I ended up doing a joint honours degree in philosophy and English literature. Um, I think I progressively just discovered that um, the questions I was most interested in were the philosophical ones, um, and then uh, went on from there to do some postgraduate study at uh, Oxford in the UK, um, where I did a, a thesis on an ethics topic. And... Um, discovered that, that that's that's really um, what makes me tick and what, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, so why did you uh, end up specialising in ethics and political philosophy? I suppose it was because um, the questions that it asks seem to me really important ones. I mean, they're, they're ones that uh, engage uh, most of us in, in some way. Um, and philosophy just offered a way of thinking about these with rigor and clarity um, uh, and uh, depth as well. So uh, it's, it's a subject where uh, you keep asking the questions until you get to a, a point where um, you think you've really reached a foundation from which you can answer them. Okay, so who influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? Yeah, I think that probably the most influential people were my um, PhD supervisors. Um, so I had three three of those. Um, one was Jonathan Glover. Um, there was James Griffin as well, and Derek Parfit. Um, and uh, these three people all really impressed me, uh, both with their intellect, uh, their, their intellectual seriousness, um, the quality of their own work, and just uh, the way in which they were able to convey this sense of um, the importance of philosophy and and the possibility of progress as well, and uh, I, I suppose the support they gave me was was really quite influential in convincing me that um, I could go on with this um, as a professional philosopher. Yeah, it's interesting. So. Uh, you were, your supervisor was Derek Parfit, one of your supervisors. How was he as a supervisor? Yeah, so he, he was one of my supervisors. Well, he was a very impressive man. Um, so uh, you, you kind of got the impression with him that um, there wasn't really a limit to the amount of um, uh, philosophy that he could absorb. And um, uh, the... I suppose the way in which you would engage with your work as well was always looking for um, where it was headed. And he was able to um, uh, really offer an overview of um, the structure of your work and um, uh, the directions in which you might take it. Um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a great um, uh, privilege, really, to, to work with um, someone who's so intellectually gifted um, and I suppose I had a fair, fair amount of interaction with him after, um, after I'd finished my study as well. Um, 
uh, reading and commenting on his own work. Yeah, so Derek Barfit was one of the best, one of the best moral philosophers that we have around. But let's get into that. So how do we define moral philosophy or ethics? Yeah, so I think um, words like morality and ethics get used with slightly different meanings. Um, and I tend to think of uh, there being four different sorts of ideas that get attached to um, ethics and morality. Um, so one of these is just this very general question, how should I live? Um, a second somewhat narrower question is, um, what's the right way to uh, interact with others? Um, what, what are the appropriate forms of regard for others? Um, a third kind of topic, um, which some would say is uh, a, a, a topic which is part of our culture, but not part of all ethical cultures, um, is the topic of accountability to others. Um, so responsibility being held to standards for which uh, you can be blamed if you don't, don't meet them, um, and which give rise to attitudes such as guilt, resentment, indignation, um, also, you know, their positive counterparts um, and attributions of obligation. And some people see this as a quite a culturally specific um, phenomenon, which they reserve the term morality for. Um, and then the fourth thing um, is connected to the standards of behaviour um, that we should publicly advocate and abide by. And uh, when you hear people talking about professional ethics, they're typically talking about the fourth thing. Um, and I think uh, one way of thinking of moral philosophy is it's the topic that deals with all of those things. Um, I myself uh, like to keep things simple. So I um, tend to think of morality in the second of those ways. So morality concerns the other regarding, how, how we should um, treat others and the constraints on our own behaviour that a proper regard for others places on us. Um, and then it's the business of moral philosophy to say what they are um, and why. Okay, so what are the dominant ethical theories in this regard? Yeah, so I think um, you can see them as belonging to four main families. Um, and the first of them is probably the most familiar. So um, what moral theories typically try to do is find one foundation for ethics or morality. Um, and perhaps the most popular one is a foundation in uh, welfare, in concern for the welfare of, or interests of, of others. Um, and the most famous uh, philosophical theory of morality, utilitarianism, is a theory of that kind that says um, your welfare is your happiness. Um, and the right thing to do is to take into account not just your happiness, but uh, everyone's happiness or the happiness of uh, every person or uh, non-human animal that has uh, happiness or welfare um, and to maximise that impartially. So that's one kind of view. A second kind of uh, moral theory focuses on respect for autonomy and the Kantian tradition uh, tends to emphasise that. So that's less about um, me providing others with things that benefit them, um, but me providing the space for others to lead their own lives, to, to make their own decisions about themselves. Um, and I think restrictions on paternalism, on um, forcing people to do things for their own good, uh, appeal to that second kind of source. Um, so that's, that's two ideas. A third one uh, is connected to cooperating together um, towards the common good. Um, and so-called contractualist theories of morality tend to emphasize that third idea. Um, and I suppose um, uh, in the descriptive sciences look, that look at trying to explain where morality comes from and how it has evolved its way into us, um, an emphasis on uh, dispositions to cooperate in groups uh, tend to be uh, prominent. Um, and then the fourth idea, which is a very ancient one, um, connects ethics or morality to um, achieving uh, 
perfect excellence as a human being. Um, so this sort of relies on the idea that there are capacities that we have as humans. Um, and then goodness in a human being involves uh, developing those capacities to the highest extent. Um, uh, and I, I, I think it, um, it's useful to see um, certainly uh, moral philosophy in the Western tradition as developing those four ideas in often in competition with each other. And then there are some theories that try to combine them in, in some way. So interesting. So these are the four dominant theories. You have utilitarianism, the Kantian, duty-based yep. theories. You have the social yep. contractarians, the, like law, yep. Hobbes. And of course, That's right. yeah, your virtue ethics as well. I wonder, yeah. Well, yeah, because in your work, you're emphasizing these things as well. But what do you think is the I am. right yeah. here? So, right, good. So, so um, I think a, a view of any of those four kinds, so the welfareist, the respect-based, the contractualist, or the perfectionist uh, kind of view, um, are typically developed as what I would call a monistic kind of theory. So they uh, ultimately aim to identify one master principle for the whole of morality, which is based around one of those four ideas. Um, and in my view, so I'm, I'm a pluralist, um, and I think it's helpful to think of morality, that's to say the other regarding um, part of how we ought to live, um, as fundamentally based around the first three of those ideas. Um, so I think of uh, concern for others' welfare, um, respect for their autonomy, and then a um, willingness to join in with worthwhile collective activities as three independently important uh, uh, parts of treating uh, other people well and relating to other people well. So I think um, if I tell someone, say I tell a young child um, not to be selfish, if they're a little philosopher in the making, they might um, come back to me and say, well, what exactly do you mean by selfishness? What's selfishness and what's unselfishness? And I think actually that it's three different things. So one way of being selfish is uh, not to take other people's welfare into account. Another is to be domineering and push them around, make them do things even for their own good. And a third one is just not to be prepared to join in um, when you see something um, uh, worthwhile that's being done or so it's something that's being done to produce some public benefit um, and you take the benefit and you're not, not prepared to pitch in towards paying the cost. Um, and then the way I think the fourth tradition works um, is that one form of excellence in a, in a human life or one way of being good um, is to respond to those first three sorts of moral reasons. So to be unselfish in those, those um, three different ways. Um, so that's the way I um, want to kind of put together the insights from those different traditions. Perhaps here's another way of putting it. So we want to be excellent individuals. We want to be good individuals. And because of that, we need to look out for the welfare of others, respect their economy and cooperate with them in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. And um, I think it, one, one of the ideas that the ancient philosophers had was that um, that's actually a way of um, benefiting yourself. So it's a way of achieving what's good for you um, is to be excellent in various ways. Um, and I think while perhaps it's um, overly optimistic to think that that's always true, um, so sometimes being morally good can, can be self-sacrificing. Um, I think for most of us, in most circumstances, it actually is true um, that it's actually a way of uh, flourishing yourself and um, achieving what's good for you is to relate to other people well. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. Uh, and those, those three ways I think of as the... Um, three basic uh, forms of moral 
um, goodness in relation to others. Now that's a good way of putting it. So you're a pluralist about the foundations of morality. There's no one foundation of morality. Hmm. But I wonder how it reflects to your other uh, focus of your work, which, which are issues in political philosophy, issues concerning rights, equality, and citizenship. Could you tell us something about what you're doing in this area of philosophy? Yeah, so um, I think a first point to make, um, which again seems to me illuminating about th this, this way of thinking about the foundational ethical ideas, um, is I think you can find different political cultures um, which emphasize one of those three ideas more strongly. So, so you've got the um, what I suppose I would think of, maybe this is a bit of a caricature, the Scandinavian um, welfareist uh, kind of political ideology where you, you have um, high taxation and you think of the central political value as being uh, looking after people's welfare. Um, a more American idea emphasizes the second of these sorts of thoughts, that's personal liberty, um, creating a, a state and regulating a state in a way that maximizes individual freedom um, and autonomy. And then the third kind of idea, um, which I, I suppose uh, I think is most strongly emphasized in some uh, of the Asian political cultures is the idea of uh, contribution towards um, a collective uh, uh, enterprise or activity. So, so the, um, the central political virtue is seen as um, contributing towards the, the activities of the group. Um, uh, now, that's, that's a bit of um, a, an exaggeration. And I think uh, many of us would think that uh, a really good political community is organised in some way around each of those values. Um, now, I suppose the, the other thing that is prominent in my approach towards political philosophy is to think of um, the kinds of foundations that uh, might be found for um, thinking of democracy as an important um, uh, way of organising a political community is via principally the application of this third sort of source. That's to say there are um, things that the group, a group can ask of from me just by way of participating in um, worthwhile collective activity. And uh, one application of this is to decision-making itself um, in a group. So if there's a group of us who are given a task to um, decide on, and we have to decide on it together, um, then part, one um, worthwhile activity I can be asked to uh, play my part in or do my share towards is conducting reasonable uh, collective decision-making together. And that involves being bound by the decisions that we've reached um, and abiding by them, even if I didn't agree with um, what the majority has uh, decided on. Um, and I think uh, accepting the umpire's decision, as it were, um, is actually an important part of um, uh, being a reasonable participant in what a group does together. Um, this is like a coordination and cooperation game? Um, yeah, so that there are elements of that. Um, but I think uh, one, one way in which we resolve problems we would otherwise have with um, uh, coordination problems or problems of cooperation is that um, we recognize that uh, one basic form of decency is to um, pitch in and uh, contribute towards um, what we're doing together. Um, and I think empirical work shows that um, uh, there is quite a um, natural and widespread disposition that uh, most of us have towards at least conditionally cooperating with others, um, saying, look, I'll, I'll uh, play fair with you as long as you play fair with me. Um, 
And that uh, comes quite naturally to most of us. Yeah, so this brings us to our main question. So moral philosophers, political philosophers are talking about things that we ought to do, what considerations we must have in, well, treating each other. But how does that idea connect with law or legal matters? Yeah, so um, I suppose it principally does so uh, uh, as I see it in the following way. So one question we face together is how are we going to formally regulate ourselves as a community? And the laws we come up with um, are our answer to that. Um, now, it seems to me that there are then connections between ethics and law that go in two directions. So um, one is the direction of um, law's dependence on ethics. Um, and one way in which there is a dependence is when we ask, um, how does law get its authority over us? Um, where by authority, we mean more than just um, that it may be wise for me or um, prudent not to break the law, because uh, if I get caught and uh, punished, that's going to be bad for me. Um, but this thought that um, there's uh, a demand that the law can rightly make of me and that the rest of the community can make of me to comply with the law. Um, and uh, I think there are really two ways in which the law gets its authority, and both of them um, appeal to a moral underpinning. So one is just if we appeal, appeal to the idea that we're sustaining the good of public order. Law is important because it um, uh, secures for us uh, social order, um, which it would be terrible for each of us to be without. Um, then one uh, basic form of contributing to um, uh, the common good is to be abiding by um, laws that secure this good for us, the good of public order. Um, so that, uh, again, seems to me to appeal to the third of these forms of unselfishness. That's to say a, a, a willingness to play my part or do my share towards our all together sustaining a, some public good. Um, and then the second way in which I think law gets its authority um, is through this thing I was mentioning um, just a, a short while ago, respect for democratic decision-making. So if there are fair and impartial uh, procedures for uh, deciding what we're going to do together, and this includes regulating ourselves by agreeing on laws, um, then uh, respect for the process of democratic decision-making, which itself um, is better than a, a, for, for each of us than a complete free-for-all, um, uh, does require that I accept the uh, decisions that the group as a whole has reached through uh, some fair procedure. Um, so I think in those two ways, law gets its authority uh, from morality. Um, and then sometimes the point of the law is to enforce morality, where, where there are really important parts of um, uh, interpersonal um, standards of behaviour, such as uh, not assaulting people um, and fundamentally violating uh, their own uh, autonomy and their own rights, um, then it's reasonable for us as a community to say um, we're going to provide strong incentives for people not to do that. We're going to protect them against uh, being mistreated. Um, and we as a community are going to insist um, that these standards are abided by. Um, and that's, uh, that's where legislation comes in. I like the picture here about authority and the legal force, or sorry, the mm. normative force of laws. I wonder how you would react to a legal positivist who would say that, well, laws and morality are separate things. So you can't ground one to the other. Yeah, so I think in practice, um, we do uh, 
when we're giving reasons for um, instituting a, a law, um, we do appeal to moral reasons. And um, it's hard to see how there's anything problematic with our doing so. Um, uh, I suppose where I would part company from uh, positivists most fundamentally um, is over the, the question what it takes for something not just to be um, a standard that's going to disincentivize uh, behavior, but a standard that really can claim to have authority over us. And I think there has to be, uh, we have to resort to um, background moral principles in order to answer that question. Um, so a positivist picture of law where, where you say, um, look, uh, if you're giving an account of what law is, um, uh, is that is just completely exhausted by facts about uh, legislative processes, um, the insti institution of certain regulations, and then uh, the existence of certain consequences for breaking them. That's, that's what it is for something to be a law. Um, that falls short of there being a standard which has um, authority over us. Um, so someone could come along and uh, threaten to impose a penalty on me, um, and it might be wise or sensible for me to try to avoid it. Um, it's a separate matter for someone to come along and say, here's a standard that actually um, uh, is not just a, 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 an incentive that's been provided uh, to you to act differently than you otherwise would. Um, but something that is an expression of the community's authority um, to require you to do something. Um, and I think that does require a moral background um, and can't be accounted for in a purely positivistic way. Yeah, so we're, we're, the picture that you're giving us is that, well, here's the law and it's grounded on morality or some principle of morality. Hmm. And actually it enforces, reinforces our views of morality as well. I wonder though how that picture affects how we think about real life issues like climate change, um, rights of strangers that you have worked on and international aid as well. Yeah, um, so I think it does so in a few ways. So one is um, we need to ask what laws should there be? Um, and when we're um, uh, confronted with these issues, either of significant international injustice um, in, in connection with uh, the disparities between um, uh, material well-being around the world, um, or these serious problems of coordination that arise surrounding climate change, um, uh, which I, I would think uh, also involves uh, a fair element of the first kind of issue of injustice as well, um, given that um, the people who are going to suffer the most from climate change are um, typically the people who've contributed least to producing it. Um, then uh, there are questions for us in deciding uh, what law should be, which are moral questions. Um, but I think um, there's also a couple of other issues that come up which are less straightforward to deal with. So, so one would be um, how far do we think we can um, resolve uh, global issues like this through uh, legislation? Um, and then in the background, there's uh, a really big picture question about the extent to which it's actually desirable to have institutions at a global level that actually do have the authority of being able to legislate for the entire global population. And I think at uh, right now, particularly with the issues surrounding climate change, we're, we're sort of looking for ways of fi finding international institutions that fall short of actually legislating for the world, um, but uh, can provide us with forums in which um, we can form agreements with incentives to comply with them and uh, penalties for not complying with them, um, which might uh, have the function of coordinating 
um, our actions towards uh, something that works to, to the benefit of everyone. Um, and I suppose what's going on now is, is really a, a huge and very important global experiment in how far we can get in doing that. Um, I'll just add one, one other thing. So I think with uh, several of these um, uh, questions, in fact, all, all of the ones that you mentioned, uh, the question concerning climate change, um, rights of strangers, international aid. Um, there's a question for each of us that arises, um, given that we don't have legislation that has yet uh, solved uh, these problems, what any of us uh, individually morally ought to be doing. Um, and I suppose many of us would, would think at, at a minimum, we shouldn't ourselves be contributing to making things worse. Um, and more than that, uh, where we've got the capacity to uh, kind of help with one small corner of the problem ourselves uh, and could do so without significant cost to ourselves. Um, we face the question of why we're not prepared to do that. Um, and that's a moral question that applies to us independently of how we think um, large scale regulation should, should be conducted. Okay, so on a more personal note, What's your advice hmm. for those who want to get into professional academic philosophy? Okay, so um, I think this is a lot tougher now than when I was um, a graduate student first coming into the profession. Um, it's just a, a lot harder to establish yourself as an academic philosopher than it used to be. Um, and I don't say this in order to put anyone off, um, but I think one tip that I have um, for, for someone who's considering academic philosophy and um, making a career in the profession is, as you set out, you do need to have a plan B. Um, so, uh, you know, give it a, a, a real red hot go, but um, have some idea of uh, what direction you might go in if uh, it doesn't come off. But having said that, uh, my main bit of advice would be to um, think of um, your path into the profession as having two streams to it. Um, so one is just really to follow your intellectual interests, um, uh, work as deeply and rigorously on the questions that interest you the most uh, as you can. So, so that that's a that's a kind of um, uh, advice to, in a way, be be narrow. Develop your your own writing and your own research um, as deeply and uh, rigorously as as you can. So, but that's that's only one track. And the other the other track um, is, I think, to um, just get involved in as many aspects of of the profession as you're given an opportunity to do. So. Go to lots of conferences, do lots of teaching, um, get involved in professional organisations, uh, do outreach activities. Just do all the all the philosophy you can, um, and get a feel for all of the aspects of the profession. Um, and uh, establishing yourself as a professional philosopher requires being able to juggle um, those two things at the same time. Um, and I think finding finding a balance between them is something uh, we all need to do. And um, the earlier you start doing it, um, the better. So but there's my you say the, this career is worth it or is your career worth it? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I feel extremely lucky and privileged um, to be able to um, uh, spend a lifetime thinking about um, important uh, difficult questions, you know, having the ability to do that, having, having the, the um, opportunity to share ideas with other people and, and to teach. I, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I um, wouldn't trade it for anything else. Okay, so on that note, uh, thanks again, Professor Garrett Colliday for this interview. And for you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers.